Thank you, Scott, uh, for the generous introduction. What he didn't mention was that while I was a graduate student, Scott was my thesis advisor. <laughs> And so he inevitably has many stories that uh, you could ask him about at lunch if you are so curious. So they asked me today to talk about planetary billiards, the early chaos of planetary systems. So this is a little bit different than what I normally talk about. So, so there are some new angles, some things I worked in last night, uh, and some things may not, may not really have all the prerequisites to understand. But the good part is we have to have 15 minutes for questions, and there is no requirement that they be at the end. So, <laughs> I, I want to encourage people to speak up and ask questions as I go, um, because many of us, uh, the speakers today, are part of a, a longer program. I've been here for six weeks now, and during that six weeks, we've had discussions where we've asked speakers to show 10 slides and talk for 15 minutes. And after two hours, the, the next group kicks us out of the room and says, hey, it's our turn. And that style of interaction where people raise their hand and ask questions that uh, you know, maybe that in a normal talk you wouldn't, I found has been a lot more educational for me in learning about fields that I don't always, or I often don't know much about uh, in some of these interdisciplinary meetings, as opposed to last week where we had a conference and, and some of the talks I was really engaged and understood and other ones kind of by slide 15, it was getting a little bit tricky and, and I, I wasn't able to follow. So I want people to interrupt uh, sincerely. Hopefully uh, people will feel free to do that. So, so perhaps the, the basic reason we're here is that recently, uh, is, is there a chance of making the screen come on? <laughs> is that the, the past two decades or so, we've had an explosion of growth in a knowledge about planetary systems beyond our own. So there's been hundreds of years of, of study of our solar system, people learning about the planets, the moons, rings, asteroids, all sorts of fun stuff. A and one of the findings we found is that there's so many bodies that are totally distinct from everything else. Each world is a little bit different, has its own properties. And, and when we can zoom in, we learn a lot about them. But nevertheless, all of the planets in our solar system, all the moons, they all formed at the same time, in the same place, from the same stuff. And so you could imagine that maybe our solar system is not a prototype for every other planetary system. Maybe sometimes there's different stuff, the conditions are different, the time is different, and planetary systems emerge differently than our own did. And indeed, since the discovery of extrasolar planets, during the last two decades, we've continually been surprised at how different some of these planetary systems are. And those discoveries really motivate this talk. Our own solar system has eight, nine planets, I guess, depending on how you'd like to count. <laughs> but, the, but perhaps most of the information is not from those eight planets. I would say most of the information of the formation of our solar system is from the small bodies the asteroids, the Kuiper Belt objects, the dwarf planets, the, the comets, all those small bodies provide a wealth of information tracing out how objects behave in different positions in different orbits. And we can use those to try to reconstruct a little bit about the history of our own solar system. And the history of our solar system is very different than today. Today, the, the solar system has eight planets. For the most part, they go around pretty regularly Nothing too exciting happening in terms of big, big violent events. But in the past, there were lots of, of close encounters, impacts, planets moving around. And, and we can see that, appreciate that now in our own solar system. That happened as well. And, and so this sort of puts at, puts at odds the, uh, an early idea that I had of the clockwork universe. That if I just listened to Scott long enough and, and figured out all the complicated equations, I could work out how the universe would evolve. And, and it's an appealing idea. And in some sense, the laws of physics, at least once we get to, to the scale of planets, are deterministic, and it seems like we should, could work things out like that. But the discovery of planetary systems around other stars has, has helped us appreciate how different these planetary systems are and how, how they aren't always quite so simple. Um, <laughs> And in particular, 
NASA's Kepler mission that you'll hear about later in the day has begun to discover hundreds of planetary systems, thousands of planets, where we have a, a, a legitimate planetary system, multiple planets orbiting the same star. And, and they're quite different from each other and our solar system. So uh, the, the, the one figure you, you might recognize here is our inner planetary system, Venus, uh, Mercury, Earth, Mars. Um, and, and you see hundreds of other planetary systems here. Uh, and the, the first thing you notice is they're smaller, small enough that the, uh, the author decided to have a zoom in to, to appreciate some of those close-in planetary systems. And the second thing you notice is, is the circles, the, the planets, are a whole lot bigger in, in most cases. And that's because many of these planetary systems have, have lots of mass crammed in very close to their host star compared to our own solar system. So, so this is sort of, it's one level, I mean, for this GIF, everything is clockwork. They're moving on nice circular orbits at uniform rates, going around and around and around. And that's sort of our first, first approximation of what these planetary systems might be like. But as we delve deeper, uh, we can recognize that, that indeed there's some interesting interactions that aren't always quite so simple. And we want to use all the discoveries from the past two decades, different methods, including uh, those I just showed, but including those from uh, Doppler surveys that you'll hear about from other speakers later in the day, to provide inspiration for new ideas about planet formation. And, and so we can sort of a check on our understanding of, of which of the things we developed to explain our solar system after centuries of thought appear to be robust and applicable beyond our solar system as the typical way things proceed, and, and which things might be special and which things might happen in other planetary systems, but have, have missed our own. Yes? Hopefully this is not uh, too off the track, but how do you define a planet? Ah, OK. Um, in our solar system, we know a lot about each object. We can measure its mass, its density, its shape, its orbit. And we can worry about, well, how are we going to, are we going to worry more about the orbit or more about the, the sphericity of the body? And, and so we can have long debates about how we should define a planet in our solar system. And indeed, people do. <laughs> and, uh, and so there is an official IAU approved definition for planets in our solar system. Fortunately, I think, there isn't a definition of planets beyond our solar system. And part of that's because we're still in the early stages. It's young. It would, if we made a definition, we'd only have to change it sooner or later. Um, but another part is our knowledge of these other planetary systems is, is not complete. Uh, it's nowhere near as detailed as in our own solar system. And so we have a lot less to work with. So what we typically use in the context of things like, you know, if we're going to send a, a little press release for institutions saying, hey, we found some more planets, uh, we, we want a body that's smaller than the mass of 10 times Jupiter if we're able to measure its mass. Or maybe smaller than a few times the radius of Jupiter if we can measure its radius. Or maybe has a brightness not that much brighter than we think Jupiter would have been when it was a young planet if we can measure it, its brightness. So, so the, because we have different techniques that probe planets in different ways, we kind of a hodgepodge of, of whether what we can measure the planet is consistent with our notions of a planet in our own solar system. Now, I like to approach things from a theoretical side. How does, you know, how, how did they form? And if I could make my ideal definition, it would be based on the formation. How did the object form? The problem is we don't observe that. So it would be this sort of Dr. Seuss-ish de definition that you can't actually use for anything useful uh, in, in the real world. It's only useful in your computer simulations where you, you do know how it formed. So although it's very appealing, it just isn't practical. Uh, and, and observers might come out with different ideas of trying to relay it to what we can observe. Inevitably, what we can observe changes with time. And so I think it's, it's quite appropriate that we don't really have a definition for these extrasolar planets. For all the ones I'll be telling you about today are, are, are small bodies, low mass bodies, or low luminosity bodies in orbit around another star. Yeah? On your previous slide, the animation, are those all Yep. Every, every one of those is a planetary system where we have data that's, uh, we, we've seen a star, we've seen the brightness of the star change as a planet passes in front of it, we've measured the size of the planet, we've measured the time it takes for the planet to go around the star, and, and because there are 
uh, are multiple planets orbiting that same star, or multiple signals like this, we believe with, with quite high confidence that each of these is, is a, a bona fide planet. You might could imagine maybe one there's you know, some, some misinterpretation of, but by and large, all of these are, are legitimate planets. Yeah, uh, just following up on that, um, that possibility of misinterpretation, I know that all the Kepler data is from looking at a photometer readings, and, and a lot of them have been, a lot of the Kepler candidates have been confirmed by Doppler shift readings. Uh, have there been any non-confirmation? Um, okay, so uh, maybe for the rest of the audience, uh, since A, it wasn't on the mic, and B, it had some technical stuff in it. Uh, so, so the, the speaker or the uh, question asker uh, <laughs> pointed out <laughs> that, that these that these planetary systems were discovered by NASA's Kepler mission, and the way that mission works, maybe I should uh, we can uh, we can the order is irrelevant. There's no curriculum. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, maybe. Okay, yeah, here, here we go. We'll, we'll try from, from here, maybe. Uh, so, so, so NASA's Kepler mission is a spacecraft that's staring at a, a, a big patch of the sky. Uh, you can see here the, the, the plane of our galaxy, and the Kepler spacecraft has uh, a region that it's looking at, uh, this nice big patch. It may look kind of small in this picture, but compared to what other telescopes do, it's an enormous region, uh, a very large region being looked at all at the same time, about 100 square degrees, so the moon's about half a degree across, uh, for reference, and there's millions of stars in there, but it's picked about 190,000 to, to observe. And so every picture it takes looks like this. Okay, they, you couldn't tell the difference from any of them. The only only thing that's missing is this projector probably shows I don't know a million pixels or something, and the Kepler spacecraft has a hundred million pixels. So uh, if, if you zoom in, you can see that each of that little fuzzy thing is actually a whole bunch of stars, each of which, or actually not all of which, but uh, nearly 200,000 of which. They're measuring the brightness of those stars um, continuously, every 30 minutes, how bright the star is. And, and why do we do that? Um, well, th if there's a planet going around that star, when the planet passes in front of the star, it will block some of the star's light. And we can measure very precisely the, the brightness of, of the star as the planet passes in front, see how much of the star's light is blocked, learn about the planet. Um, so this is, this is pretty pretty good, pretty exciting, but, but as the, the, the questioner asked before, well, how do we know that's really a planet? Could it, could it be something else? Uh, and, and how do these, uh, how are these things uh, either confirmed or verified or, or validated? And so in the beginning, when you have a new technique that you're, you know, a new spacecraft, a new toy you're playing with, you want to be very cautious about it, right? You know, well, I better double check everything. And so the, the, the first season, we got some data back. People such as one of our, our later speakers, Jeff Marcy and Andrew Howard, they rushed out to the telescopes and they found things as fast as they could and they said, let's look at them and use the Doppler method. Oh dear, there's a whole other set of slides here. Uh, okay. so, so what they did was they uh, looked at um, they went to telescopes like uh, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Uh, that's me instead of them, even though they did 99.9% .9 of the work. Um, and, and they took the star's light and they broke it up uh, using a spectrograph, an instrument that breaks the star's light into uh, is a function of color. But not just a simple prism, but a, a design that has starlight coming in and going off a of grating. So these are the interference effects that you may have a, a physics lab about. And then a prism two, so as to spread out the light doubly. And then at the very end, uh, they have the light uh, recorded and spread out over their, their CC detector to look at the, the different colors of the starlight um, and measure the Doppler shift of the planet as the, the planet Doppler shift of the star as the planet tugs on, on the star. And so their their data looks some, something uh, like this, where it's unfortunately not in color, but aside from that, they see the, the lines in the stellar atmosphere, and those move a little bit um, as as the planet goes back and forth. Okay, now we're getting away from the Doppler. So, so let me go back to, to the Kepler things. Uh, I should have had a. So, so these Kepler planets that are found, uh, this method was used to verify some of them. So uh, not most of them, actually a very small fraction have been verified uh, using this Doppler method because it's, it's very time consuming and, and expensive in terms of telescope time. And so, uh, so some of the early ones were validated and we, and we began to build up intuition for, for what types of planets can we observe with high confidence, which types of, of planets uh, do we have to be more cautious of in interpreting? Um, and then, indeed, after the first season, with, as more time went on, people used other techniques. They observed it. 
uh, planets with the Spitzer Space Telescope. They observe planets using uh, high contrast, sitting adaptive optics, things that take, take pictures to check the stars. Uh, and then we use another technique that, that actually was kind of part of what I planned to talk about, so maybe I'll save a little bit of the transit timing for later, uh, where, where we're able to, 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 to verify the planets are interacting gravitationally with each other. And so sort of combining the, these different methods, there, there's now been several hundred planets which have either been confirmed or validated, which is sort of us being uh, nitpicky in our language, about we have enough data that, that we're confident that that system right there is a planet with something like 99% confidence. Um, the, the vast majority of, of the planets that Kepler's found have not yet been validated, and we have estimates of how reliable they are, and they're more in the line of 90%, 80% on an individual basis. So the, the overall population is still very valuable for us to, uh, for us to reason from, but the, the individual systems, some of them have, have uh, you always have to keep in the back of your mind, could this be some other astrophysical object masquerading as a planetary system? And so the, the specific question, wow, this is a, a, <laughs> a very good and involved question, was have we looked at any planetary systems where we, we think there's planets there, and then after a detailed scrutiny we decide there aren't? Um, I guess it depends on how detailed the scrutiny is. So uh, the, the process is not just sort of we, we put it on a table once and we're done, but there's a whole stage of checks we make, right? And so there are lots of objects. There are more objects that, that we found, we thought, hmm, this might be interesting, that turned out not to be planets than, than the actual real planets. But of course, when we say, hmm, they might be interesting, we don't just stop there, right? Then we go, well, we need to do some homework. And so by the time we've done our homework, um, I don't think there's a single planet among the list of uh, several hundred that we've confirmed or validated that, that we've retracted. Uh, so uh, on one hand, we've, we've realized that there's, at the first stages, yes, many of them turn out to things like binary stars. By, by the end, uh, at least so far, we've done pretty well uh, and, and hope to, to keep up our, our track record. <laughs> okay. Some good questions? Yep. <laughs> Previous. <laughs> 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 but we, I have no idea what the slide you're talking about is my point, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, well, actually this slide can work for that. Uh, so, so planets travel around their host star and they have an orbit. And that orbit, uh, we can sort of imagine it leaving behind a little trail of breadcrumbs and saying, what's the shape of the path it took? And so in the, the clockwork universe, where everything's going around on a perfect schedule, just right, those, those breadcrumb trails would be ellipses, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And so if the, the ellipse it has an eccentricity of zero, that corresponds to a circle, you know, your conic sections from classes, right? Uh, so a circular orbit would be like these planets here. Each one is on a very nice circular orbit. Uh, and in this case, the distance between the planet and the star doesn't change. And so you can imagine packing the planets uh, fairly close together. But other planets leave highly elongated orbits, so eccentric. So an ellipse, uh, it has an eccentricity, so, so related to how, how elongated is the ratio of the major and the minor axes here. Um, and, and when we have a, an orbit that's quite eccentric, uh, has an has a eccentricity, say, of order 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, we say those, those planets follow eccentric orbits. Yeah, it's like these over here. These are eccentric orbits. Uh, this was sort of meant to be a, a temporary, uh, there's a progression here, but for, for, for this question, we'll just sort of look over here at, at this nice eccentric planet. That's, that's why it's good to ask. Yeah. Sometimes, the, I, the thing I, I find is really annoying is that we use words that have a common meaning in a technical sense. And so sometimes I'm sitting there thinking I, I know what's going on, and then three slides later I realize I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and then I have to try to put, piece things back together. So, good, yeah. Have you ever seen asteroid belts or comets? Oh, boy. Um, so, so seen? <laughs> what do you mean by seen? Uh, we, we haven't really, well, OK, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, we haven't really seen it in the sense of image directly, say, an, an asteroid belt or, or a comet directly. Um, but, but there are some other things that maybe aren't too dissimilar. So we see debris, so places where we believe there is a belt of objects like, uh, like asteroids or Kuiper belt objects that are colliding with each other. When they collide at high velocity, they break, make little dust fragments. And those dust fragments then have lots of surface area. And, and you think to your laws of uh, thermodynamics, 
uh, the, each of those little dust strings is radiating infrared energy to space. And when you have a lot of surface area, th that emission can add up and be detectable. And so even though we don't actually see in cases like this the, the asteroids analogs themselves, we see the dust produced in collisions. So in some cases, we have nice images of these. At the, the conference last week, we heard from, from speakers who worked very hard to do things like study when comets or asteroids fell onto the surface of, of white dwarfs, a, a type of star that's quite old and evolved, how th those materials manifest themselves in the specter of the star. So they could determine that many planetary systems had uh, debris disks like asteroids or comets uh, around them presumably at their, their earlier stage of life. And then as the stars aged and things uh, went haywire, that material fell onto the star. And it's a way we can learn about the composition of material way out here that maybe we uh, otherwise wouldn't know about. So um, I'll go with yes, scene, but, but only with a convoluted answer. <laughs> uh, oh, and then, oh, then also there's, there's this very nice image recently came out of uh, the Alma, a radio telescope, uh, where you can see dust rings here, which is also uh, quite nice. But that's probably more, uh, more, more about the gas, really, than the dust there. Um, OK. So uh, I, I had in mind talking a little bit about uh, chaos and complexity in, in the, oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a little bit complicated because these days, you know, it's it's not like you take your camera and just snap a picture, right? So, so even the real data often has had hundreds of hours of computer processing. But, but sure, if, if I don't ever feel free to, to raise your hand and, and remind me. So, so this is real data. It's a time lapse photo uh, of here we have a piece of metal and then a, a, a double pendulum. At the bottom of the pendulum, there's a little light, a time release photo. Uh, and my point here was to compare. Or give an example that, that hopefully people have, have seen before, where uh, clearly the physics of this is, is quite simple, uh, and yet the the manifestation of it is, is quite complicated. So we know that if you have a a, a pendulum, that's sort of the that, that was the definition of clockwork for a long time, right? We we set our clocks by the period of that pendulum remaining constant. Um, but if we have a, a, a simple change to that, making it a, a double pendulum, so one pendulum at the end of the other. Right, then the, the behavior can get a lot more complicated. And, and it's kind of fun to stare at one of these if, if you uh, either have one or can make one. Uh, the, the key to making it really cool is, is getting very small coefficient of friction so that your, the energy you put in the system lasts a long time. And, and I know physics professors who, who sort of brag about my coefficient of friction, you know, allows it to run for so many hours or whatever it is. Um, so, so it's really fun, especially if you use these big you know, steel ones with stainless steel ball bearings that, and, and clamp it. Oh, in other words, it dissipates is on the, the table. Uh, so you have to really clamp these things well to make them last a long time. But anyway, uh, so the point was, in, in these videos, you can see that even though the physics is clearly very simple, that your students could understand the, the, the behavior at any one instant, if you asked a question about how does this, these simple laws of physics manifest themselves in this slightly more complex system, wow, right? It does things that, that you wouldn't expect. Uh, and so as we look at planetary systems, we have sort of a similar analogy. We go from the nice laws, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which are nice and really simple uh, and, and kind of boring in some sense. And then you just add one more planet, and bam, right? All that complexity, the interactions can really become quite noticeable and have surprising effects that, that can really change things. Um, and so I, I thought it'd be fun to think about in our own solar system, is there any evidence for, for sort of chaos and, and things hitting other bodies, impacts? I heard a yes. So, so, so can you give me an example? Surface of the moon, very good. Except for the fact that it's not the order that I originally <laughs> guessed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll uh, go over here. So, so, so what about the moon? Right. So the moon here, we see uh, it, it's a whole bunch of craters. Right. And those craters everywhere. Uh, when we zoom in, we can try to, to learn about them. We can go to the moon. We can pick up rocks. We can bring them home. We can do radioactive dating on them. Measure the the lead, the strontium, the rubidium, uranium, and figure out how old each of those rocks are. And then we can try to piece together, well, which crater came when? 
And when we do that, uh, we in infer that the, recently the rate of craters coming on the moon has been relatively steady. At a certain rate. But as we go back in time, the rate uh, goes up quite substantially, factors of, of several. And, and even though we, we can't go back all the way to the unit solar system, the, the trend is clear that as we go back in time, the rate of cratering increased. And this suggests at one time there was a whole lot of stuff hitting the moon. A good other examples of, of sort of violence in the solar system. Yeah. That's, that's a good one, um, but it's a comp really complicated answer, or response, I should say, not an answer. Uh, so, so indeed, I, I, uh, I like that idea. I mean, it just seems good, cool to me, but I, I think there's a significant fraction of the planetary science community, uh, probably even the majority, that, that now believes that the, the retrograde rotation of Venus may be related to tidal effects. Um, and it's, it's pretty complicated. So uh, at, for at least once, I'll, I'll temper myself and not try to explain that because uh, I, I know I couldn't succeed. Uh, and it would take us you know, the entire time. But, but yeah, so, so, the, so one possibility, possible explanation for the rotation of Venus is maybe it was rotating in the same way it orbits the sun and sort of one big impact caused it to, to ro rotate in the other direction. Um, but you, know, you, could, you could maybe turn that around. I can't, I'm so tempted to do this, right? And, and like, why does the Earth rotate in the same way it re revolves around the the sun. I mean, should it really be doing that? Mars? Like, is it a coincidence? Or is it? So, so, so that's a tricky one that, that could be a whole lecture to itself. Uh, maybe some simple evidence for mix. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, so, so the sun certainly is, uh, its surface is quite violent. Um, I guess I was, uh, I wasn't very clear. I, I was sort of thinking about in terms of orbital dynamics. So, so things that, that I really could assign to one of your students to understand and yet could get them to collide with each other. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Um, let's see, where's that one? Uh, so, so, so over here, yeah, so, so back in, what was it? It was maybe the, the early 90s or so? Uh, so th there's this comet that, that actually swung by Jupiter many decades before, and when it swung by, the tidal forces split it apart into a whole, uh, a whole series of smaller bodies, and then they sheared apart as they approached Jupiter, and they started to, to impact Jupiter as they penetrated through the cloud layers. We got to see the infrared radiation coming from lower in its atmosphere, and then the optical wavelengths, we could see these big scars and pockmarks rotate by as the different objects hit it. And, and yeah, so, so Jupiter has an important role in, in sort of changing the orbits of these small bodies. When they come close to Jupiter, their orbit can be deflected. And because Jupiter's so big, close doesn't have to be that close, right? So they can come close enough to Jupiter to get deflected without actually hitting it. And, and ones that hit are actually much less common than ones that just have their orbits uh, redirected by, by Jupiter. Not only do they hit Jupiter, um, but, but sometimes they go all the way into the sun. So, I mean, it's sort of remarkable for, for a long time people didn't know this, but then we had a, a spacecraft that was designed to, to look at uh, the sun to study s stellar uh, activity. And there's a, a coronagraph, so there's a, there's a disk blocking out most of the star's lights because it would be it's way too bright. But the outer regions of the sun that they were trying to study, they, they realized that, you know, it's hundreds of these comets a year they find uh, that, that are basically falling into the sun. Some of them uh, evaporate more than fall directly on, other ones uh, impact. But so these comets that we, we didn't really even appreciate existed are sort of constantly, even today, being thrown in all the way to the sun. And we see evidence for this uh, on other, around other stars as well. Yeah, any other, other, other good examples? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, actually just the, earlier this week we had a, a great talk, um, but, by, actually, multiple speakers addressed this, but, but Sarah had the best, uh, <laughs> Sarah Stewart had the best slide here, so this is, uh, <laughs> so she gets to, to have the picture, she, she was discussing uh, work where they've tried to understand the formation of the moon, and, and the, the leading theory for how the moon formed is that a, a large body, and the debate was, was it Mars size? Was it half Earth size? Did it hit it at a 45 degree angle or a 30 degree angle? Right? So, so it, yeah, astronomers love to work at these details um, to try to explain all the intricacies. But it, it collided with the Earth. And, uh, and when it collided with the Earth, uh, I guess that slide's hidden. Uh, it launched a bunch of debris into space. Um, and then that uh, stayed in orbit around the Earth. And then that reaccumulated uh, to, to form our moon, left behind some material on the moon's surface. Uh, the moon's surface is very similar to the mantle of the, 
the Earth. And so comparing those compositionally, we have strong reasons to believe that the, the moon and the Earth sort of originated from such an impact, had a common uh, material making them up. And so, uh, yeah. Okay, so I think we, we've probably got... Oh, but, but, but... Okay, so we've gotten lots of... But what, but what the, the one I, I thought would... I thought might be the first thing people would think of. Uh, it was meteors, right? Any night, I guess I'm an astronomer, it's the first thing I think of, is if you go up and you look at the sky, and okay, maybe I don't see this, I wish I did, uh, uh, the Leonids on a you know, great year with an artist impression, <laughs> and then here we have actual time-lapse photography. <laughs> okay, maybe not quite as impressive as, uh, as one of the great storms, but, <clears throat> but occasionally we see some pretty cool things uh, on Earth. Uh, just uh, n- not that long ago, yes, and what? Oh my goodness, I'm fine. Uh, uh, really, it played before. Well, anyway, uh, you, you can all go on YouTube and, and find the, the videos of this uh, meteor that fell over Russia. And the, the unique thing about this was not that it's that rare, it was that it was caught on dash cams of you know, people driving cars and things. So uh, the prolifer- pro- proliferation of, of cheap video recording devices uh, has made it so that when there is a, a large a uh, body like this over a populated area, there's a, a chance that we have videos posted to YouTube of it. Um, and those, those, uh, those meteors uh, they, and things that can hit the Earth come from the asteroid belt, but not just any old asteroid belt object. They have to, to kind of have their orbit cross the Earth. And so we need Jupiter or, or Mars or Earth or Venus to have their gravity perturb these uh, asteroids so they begin to, to change. And once they uh, get pushed just a little bit, then they can encounter a region where there's a resonance, uh, a strong interaction between uh, Jupiter and the a body to, to kick up it, its orbit much more rapidly so that eventually it becomes crossing with the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and then we can get these, uh, these, these nice meteor showers. Uh, it's really just from the, the very small fragments coming off of them and the occasional big, bright uh, one that, that people notice. Um, and then another sort of fun thing to, to look up is the uh, there was another, Russia for some reason manages to, to get a bunch of these. I guess it's a, a large landmass. Um, <laughs> uh, in the, the early 1900s, there was a, a one that actually, well, actually it still didn't even reach the Earth. It, it, it uh, exploded while it's still above the Earth, we believe. But nevertheless, it sort of left a, a really big uh, sort of area, swath of, of space that where trees were just leveled and, and you know, remained for, for a long time. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, impact craters. Uh, this one is, is in Arizona, so it's probably the most practical to go and see. But at, with Google Earth, people now kind of cruise around, and they just find these things that no one had noticed before. It's pretty amazing. that uh, Geologists, obviously, have, have found lots of the most conspicuous ones, but some of them, uh, through erosion and, and forestation and things, uh, were hard to recognize until there was enough satellite imagery and, and eyes on them. Uh, that we can sort, start to appreciate some of these impact craters on Earth, like the moon, but ours are harder to find because of all the, the life and erosion and, and weathering that uh, changes them. Okay, well, um, you know, I guess the, the, perhaps the most cons- conspicuous in the last 100 million years was probably the one that, that took out the dinosaurs. Um, yeah, so, so how are we doing on time here? So, Scott, how long would you say we have? Ten minutes. Okay, well, uh, that was all fun. Uh, I was going to tell you a little bit. <laughs> I was going to tell you a little bit about uh, about some of the, the discoveries from uh, astronomers who have been observing these other planetary systems, and, and before or. That the same contemporaneous with the Kepler spacecraft over the past couple of decades, astronomers have worked really hard to discover planets uh, in orbit around other stars with orbital periods uh, typically a few years down to a few days, and sizes typically similar to the, or masses similar to that of Jupiter, um, somewhere around the size of Neptune. And then the, the, the Kepler mission really found a lot of small bodies, uh, so that wow, there's, the, we found out that what we had been finding. Well, really, we were finding them because they were easy to find, comparatively speaking. Um, but really, nature made a whole lot of objects that were s- smaller uh, and much harder to find, uh, but also much more abundant in nature. And then I, I was going to mention uh, one example, sort of a prototype system for, for what these are like, was the Kepler-11 system. So this is a, a planetary system where we found six planets, each of which passed in front of its star. Now, if you think about that, in order to get a planet to pass in front of a star, from our point of view, things have to be lined up pretty well, right? Because you could easily see the planet and just have its orbit be nearly face on and not pass in front of the star. And for two, well, that seems kind of, you know, kind of unlikely, but okay, we looked at a lot of stars. 
three, four, five, six. Like, what are the odds, right? And so, so systems like this tell you that it's not just coincidence that we see this, but rather these planets all share a very similar orbital plane. So they all have the same uh, path, and since the fact that we see one makes it much more likely we'll see the others. And so detecting these can be tricky. Uh, at, at the beginning, when the, the data start, first starts to come in, uh, you can kind of be confused. Why does the planet size look like it's changing? Its period isn't constant. But pretty quickly, uh, you start to figure out, oh, there's multiple planets there. Uh, and then you start piecing together the story. When there's two, OK, it comes together pretty quickly. When there's three, you know, it can be a little more confusing, right? And then as you get these more richer and richer systems, uh, disentangling them and understanding them can be quite a, quite a chore, uh, quite involved. But once you do, it's really worth it. Um, so in this case, I was mentioning how, how these planetary systems had lots of planets packed very close to their star. There's five planets, all sort of similar in size to, to Neptune's and, and quite more massive than the Earth, uh, packed inside the orbit of Mercury, and the six planets between uh, Mercury and Venus, if we compare it to the solar system. So, so these are sort of qualitatively different than our solar system. And uh, it's not alone. There are, there are uh, a whole bunch of planetary systems that are, you know, these, these are just a, actually a small fraction of the ones that have been found. And we can use their sizes and spacings to try to learn about uh, the, the planetary systems in the universe and what that tells us about uh, how they formed. Now, now uh, one particularly interesting process is, is orbital resonance. So if I have two planets orbiting the same star, gravity, it falls off as one of R squared. And so when most of the time, the planets are pretty far apart. But every now and then, the two planets line up. And when they make a line, they sort of get as close to each other as they're going to get for a while. And so the, the strength of gravity is strongest then. And they get, so you can think of it as a little kick, right? Most of the time, they don't see each other. But they get a little kick each time they come. And their orbit can uh, be, be perturbed a little bit. And for most planetary systems, like our solar system, like uh, Kepler-11, those kicks, they sort of are just random. And, and so the effect of them is it's pretty subtle and barely noticeable. But if you had a planetary system where those, those little bitty kicks all went the same direction time and time again, they could start to accumulate. And so that the analogy would be uh, just a child on a swing set kicking their legs. right? If they just kind of flail randomly, they just kind of move a little bit at the bottom, and nothing really interesting happens. But once they learn to, to, to kick their legs at the right time, the little bitty mass of those dinky little legs can start to propel them you know, halfway up the swing set. Uh, and so in the same way, that the small interactions from these, between these two planets, if they're able to, to coherently add it time and time again, can have a big effect on the orbits. And so we want to, to look and see how common are, are interactions like that. Uh, in particular, if, if we had gone in order, I, I would have asked a question <laughs> asking about uh, how do we explain why some planetary systems are so close to their host star. Uh, and, and one of the, the theories for that was that maybe the planets formed while there was still enough gas around to cause their orbits to, to migrate throughout the disk. And so this was one of the topics of a lot of discussion last week, worrying about the details. Did they migrate most when they were small or when they were big? And, and all the different evidence for that. Um, and, and so some of the, the data we have to, to, to bring to bear on that has to do with the spacing of these planetary systems. Because if, if planets were, were moving through these disks in a nice, smooth, slow fashion, then when they came into these resonant configurations, the, the, the strength of the interactions would build and they would stay in resonance. Uh, and so we can look at the ratios of orbital periods of all these planetary systems. So we, we find thousands of planets. We say, OK, find the time it takes you to go around the sun, the time it takes your neighbor to go around the sun. Take those two periods, divide them, and ask, what's that number? And that's this histogram on top is looking at what those numbers are. And the first thing you notice is it's kind of a big, broad swath. That's so that most of these planetary systems have spacings that aren't particularly near one of these obvious residences. If you keep staring at it longer, eventually, and you look at the dotted lines, conveniently added to guide your eye, uh, then, right, then, then you'll see that around places like 2 to 1, where one planet goes around twice as much as the other, 3 to 2, uh, there, there are a little bit of changes in, in the, the spectrum. And so we, we have some evidence uh, that there's at least some planetary system where these residences are important. And, and, and some of the astronomers and, and uh, planetary scientists from last week uh, we're interpreting that as evidence that th these planets may have interacted with a disk and, and helped contribute to the, the evolution of their orbits so they became trapped in these resonances. Um, are we going to get you to play or not? Oh, come on. It was such a nice picture. <laughs> 
Oh, I have to click on it. Is that what's going on? Um, okay. Well, uh, the, the the other nice thing is that when uh, when you do have planets that are near one of these residents, those little bitty kicks that cause their orbits to change, sometimes they're detectable. And so remember that the Kepler spacecraft is staring at, at the brightness of these stars and recording when planets pass in front of it. Um, and, and so you can think of that as a clock, going back to this analogy of the clockwork universe, and, and that planet serving as the thing you're going to set your watch by. But if you have several planets packed all close together, well then, these two clocks these can interact with each other, and the orbits aren't perfectly periodic, and the deviations of the, those orbits due to the planets' interactions with each other can serve it as a way to, to measure the mass of the planets, the strength of those interactions, and find out uh, more about those planetary systems. So we really love these systems because they provide opportunities to do things like characterize the masses uh, of planets, figure out their densities. Once we, we've learned about their densities, then we can begin to make comparisons to materials uh, in, in our own solar system. What, what could they be made of? Do they have rock and ice and gas and cores? And, and a lot of other questions that then come back to address the questions of how these planetary systems may have formed. So, uh, yeah, so, 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 so I sort of, a little bit about, we found lots of planets very close to our star. Why is that? One of the ideas was this migration idea. Uh, and I guess given the time, maybe, uh, maybe it's best to, to go ahead and just open it back up to questions again so we can uh, make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. What's that? Oh, oh, oh so do, you want, do we want to give the microphone so people can hear the questions? Do we have a second mic as well? Uh, well, well, we'll make do with one. Uh, so I was curious with the the proliferation now of multiple planet systems and the detection methods, how you went about, um, and I don't know enough about the details of the statistical methods, but it would seem like as you add more and more planets, you get into the, well, I have as many degrees of freedom to fit my model as I want, understanding that every method has a little bit of detection mm -hmm. limit, so maybe, you know, how do you control for th that limitation versus also the, what, what maybe it is this blip was caused by one planet that's way far out that I'll never, you know, in the next hundred years, never see the, the second orbit to, to verify. Yeah, so, so the question was sort of, when we have data, our goal as scientists is to find the simplest explanation of that data that's good enough, but, 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 but not too complex, right? What, we could always say, oh, well, maybe there's 22 planets, maybe there's 23 planets, right? I can always make my model fit my data better. And yet we have to ask, well, you know, that might just be me sort of be being a sort of data analysis looking for, for elephants in the woods or whatever it is, or you know, tigers in the woods trying to eat me. <laughs> See, I, I don't spend that time in the woods there. Um, but <laughs> and, and so we're trying to, to figure out what's, what's the minimum required to explain our data. And so if you have a hypothesis like, well, I'm going to start assuming there's no planets. Right, and then you go and say, well, let me disprove that hypothesis. OK, there needs to be at least one planet. OK, what, do I, what can I learn with that one planet? And then you can ask, well, is that, is that model good enough? Or, or when I put in how that one planet affects the stars, there's still something else I can't explain. And so uh, we have to, to be cognizant of that. And, and the different methods play out differently. So one of the nice things about the transit method, where we see the planets pass in front of the star, is we have information about one planet at a time. And so I see this planet pass, and I can ask, does, it, does, does the amount of light blocked, is it the same? Is the time it takes to pass in front of the same? Is the time between transits? And so I have a lot of tests to make sure that this object is the same as the one that happened so many days ago and will happen so many days in the future. Um, nevertheless, sometimes there, there can be complications. Uh, but, but that one's relatively simple because the signal is compact in time. With other methods, like the, the Doppler method uh, a little bit later, the, the signal of all the planets is happening at, all the time. So the, the gravitational tug of every planet is tugging the star every which way constantly. And so we can only measure one, you know, the star itself. And if it has one planet or ten planets, all their gravity is contributing that same signal. And so that's a, a much more difficult challenge. And some of the, the statistical methods we work on trying to figure out uh, how to quantify the significance of the different signals is, is a little bit involved. But in the end, it really turns down to just basic logic and putting numbers in all of that logic and, and doing those integrals to, to calculate the probabilities uh, appropriately. So sometimes it's painful, but uh, 
but it's actually relatively straightforward to to conceptualize and then harder to actually implement in, in practice. Eric, maybe instead of that slide, you could put up your uh, a mosaic of all your slides, and if people see a slide that interests them. <laughs> they, um, oh, yeah, but the problem is I put all the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll see anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, uh, now I've managed to block the. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Was it? <laughs> go away, little toolbar. There you go. Okay. <laughs> So my understanding of how our solar system formed was that the outer gas planets, uh, they formed further away from the sun because the gases were able to condense at those relatively cooler temperatures. How is it that we're finding all these gas, incredibly huge gas giants, really close to the sun or their planet or their, their star, I mean? A great question, and that's one of the, the big topics uh, of this workshop that we've been organizing the, the past several weeks. Uh, is trying to understand the origin of, of planets close to their host star. So uh, our idea prior to the discovery of these for how giant planets formed was that if a planet formed to be big enough to hold on to hydrogen while there was still gas around, it would capture that hydrogen hold on to it. And so we thought that in the outer solar system, because it's further away from the host star, the, the temperatures are cooler and things like ice could condense out of the, the material that was spotted around the, the star to form a core, a, a sort of a solid body early enough that it could grow to capture that hydrogen while the gas was still there. But in the inner solar system, because the, the, it was too hot for ice to condense, there was much less material that could go into solid bodies. And by the time they grew big enough, the gas was gone. So that was sort of the, the simple picture in the 90s, um, and, and, and even continuing uh, until quite recently, as to why the gas giants were far away um, and not the inner solar system. Now that we recognize that there are giant planets, well, actually, I should, I should caution that. So there are giant planets close to our star, but they're a relative rarity. So about half a percent of stars, they have a, a Jupiter-sized planet with an orbital period of a few days. At first, that was really exciting. Hey, look at these, you know, all hundreds of giant planets really close to our star. But now we recognize that that's sort of the, the oddity, um, a much rarer outcome than, say, a Neptune-sized planet close in. And so what, one of the sort of big debates is, do these objects basically form where we see them today, maybe modulo a factor of two in distance, so, so moving around a little bit, um, and grow up there? Or did they form further out in the disk more in line with what, what you discussed and, and what we said for Jupiter, but then once they formed, move through that gas to, to where we see them today. And, and there were you know, compelling arguments why every model was great and also why every model had problems. Uh, and that's, that's why we have to continue to work on it. So uh, the, the, the giant planets, uh, that was actually originally what I planned to talk about, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the Neptunes kind of have more possibilities because they, they're, they're it, the, the giant planets have so much gas, it, it's really hard to explain any way other than they accrete that mass directly from the, the nebula in which they formed. But these smaller planets, the ones, uh, say, Earth size, a few Earth size, you know, it, it's, it's tempting to try to ask if that may have been more like the Earth's atmosphere, uh, coming sort of material dissolved in the, in the, the rocks that was outgassed, water uh, coming from comets or asteroids, and it's sort of pushing things to make it work, particularly for the ones the size of Neptune rather than Earth. Um, but, but those are the discussions we're having, uh, trying to work out. Recently, there was a news that they found uh, planets which have more conspicuous rings than Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, do you think the mechanism of formation of rings in those planets is consistent with our understanding of uh, rings in our solar system? Oh, boy. Um, th there's a very... Uh, so astronomers observe lots of stuff. And they look at lots of stars. And then the ones that look just like everything else, they don't go bother going back to. But the ones that are weird, like, oh, this one's weird. Let me go study it. Um, so there's a, there's a very interesting object, which no doubt uh, has something very interesting going on. Um, the, the most reasonable explanation that you know, has sort of been presented in the published literature has been that this uh, could be a planet with a very large ring system. Um, but it, it's, it's a little bit delicate. I mean, it, it requires sort of just-so story. The rings are so big, they wouldn't last very long, for example. 
so we'd have to be looking at a special time to have seen them. So it's possible. Um, that's one interpretation of the data, and, and perhaps even the best interpretation of this time. But, but I, would, I would caution against trying to, to explain those, worry too much about the explanation, because it really is the first observation uh, of such a system that, that there's sort of a history. The first one you observe isn't really representative, right? Because by definition, the, the first one you saw needed to be special for you to see it, or you, know, or you would have found something else first. So I'm a little bit cautious in trying to interpret that system because the rings are so big that it, it really would uh, be rare for us to, to see them. So you have to wonder if there might be something else going on that we don't, don't quite understand. So the good news is it's not just science fiction. There's, there's testable hypotheses for future observations that can be made to test that ring prediction. And so uh, as those happen, I think we'll get a better picture as to whether or not that system is one that we really need to, to stretch ourselves to try to understand how did, how did it form and how did it survive so long, or whether maybe there's something else weird going on. Eric is being very polite, so let me just add a comment. You know, there's a, a well-known uh, metric for uh, how, you, how you should think about these, these things. You, know, you can convince your kids that there's a tooth fairy, um, but if you have some event that needs two tooth fairies to have visited in the same night, it's, it's getting a little improbable. And I think this is a two to three tooth fairy uh, discovery. <laughs> We are being recorded, Scott. <laughs> Back there. Yeah, I just had a question about tooth. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> the uh, so with the transit method with Kepler, are you able to determine or estimate a planet's mass without using the Doppler shift? Uh, so, so for. The prior to Kepler, the the way that we measured masses was. You know, pr predominantly, overwhelmingly, with its Doppler method, uh, where uh, it, it has both great strengths and, and some challenges. It finds planets that are typically close to its host star more effectively than those further away. And so we still are able to do that for some of the brighter stars. So a Kepler target that's bright enough for them to study, they can go and, and spend several nights at the telescope and use that method, and that works great. Um, because Kepler is staring at one patch of the sky, most of the stars it's seeing are pretty far away, right? Most of your stars, the reason you have so many is because it's seeing stars a significant chunk across the galaxy. And so those stars tend to be fainter. And when they're fainter, they're a pain to observe because you don't get as much light and you want to spread this light over all those color ranges. Um, and so we have been using another technique as well that really was proposed before Kepler and people tried it, but basically it, it hadn't really done anything useful until Kepler came around because by timing when the planets pass in front of their host stars and looking from these deviations from a perfect periodicity, we're able to detect the strength of the interactions between planets. And that the strength of those interactions is related to mass over radius squared, or distance squared. The distance we can infer from the, the orbital periods and Kepler's laws. And so that leaves us with the mass as something uh, to figure out. That's a little bit too simple because remember, not all planets travel on circular orbits. If they're eccentric, if they're elongated, then the distance between those two planets at closest approach won't just be uh, the difference in their same major axes, the radii of their circles. And so that complication means that for some of these systems, we measure their masses very precisely, a few percent. And we get all excited at those, and people try to explain them in, in remarkable detail. But for most of the ones we measure, there's still a, a, a larger uncertainty, sometimes 10%, sometimes 30% uh, in their masses. So if you ask how many planets do you have information about their mass. Oh, hundreds! We can tell you that they have to be at least this massive, uh, or, or at most this massive. Um, but if you ask sort of how many you measure precisely, then this method is, is still in its infancy. And we're trying to expand that so that we'll be able to do dozens uh, it, uh, of objects. But it'll be a, a challenge that'll last a few years. So at the beginning of the, uh, like she said, our solar system is not necessarily the prototype. So looking at all the Keplerian systems, has there a pattern emerge where we see the distribution of masses, or is there not enough found yet that we can say for sure? Um, so, so there's plenty of systems that have been found. The challenge is that the way we find them affects what we find. Uh, so when you have a method that's, uh, in the case of trans, for example, we only see planetary systems that have planets passing in front of their star. If it were, uh, you know, for every one of those, there's probably dozens, if not hundreds, of planetary systems where planets aren't passing in front of their host star. And so we have to, to try to take into account both what we see and the process by which we, we found them. And so that's something that uh, 
we sort of knew we were going to have to do, but it, inevitably, as you get into the details, it becomes more and more important. So some of the, the discussions we've been having the past week and the past six weeks have been, we see patterns in the plants we found, but we want to establish which of those patterns are, are truly the way nature is, and which of those have been sculpted by the design of our experiment. And so uh, some of the things that, for example, people are talking about is if you look at the closest, uh, sorry, the, the, the planets that are smallest, and you measure what are their masses, um, then you see that most of those planets uh, appear to be quite small so that you don't need to invoke gas to explain their size. But as you go out, you start to see planets that have uh, small masses and large radii. And, and you think you do need gas to explain them. And so then there was uh, some discussion of, well, uh, you know, the, the, the measurement precisions, these different objects, different techniques, what sort of biases there are. So uh, there are also discussions of we see patterns emerge related to the, the s types of planetary systems we find and the properties of the host star in terms of what metals are in its atmosphere. Uh, and so th those, that, I mean, since the early 90s, people have been sort of wondering, I, I think there's a pattern here. No, I don't think there is. Yes, I do. And, and now that we have this much richer data set, it, it's pretty clear that there, there are patterns emerging uh, in terms of the frequency of, of small planets, the frequency of hot Jupiters uh, with metal-rich stars. And we, we infer that the stars that have a lot of metal in their atmospheres and, okay, I should be careful with metal here, but I, what I really mean is, is things other than hydrogen and helium. <laughs> uh, so, so silicon and oxygen and carbon and iron and magnesium, all that good stuff um, that we see in the atmosphere of the star, presumably the disk that made that star was rich in those materials. Hence, material that could have created solids, dust grains, and pebbles may also have been more rich. And so uh, we're, we're trying to infer from you know, what we're able to measure directly into the properties that create those planetary systems and piece together self-consistent stories or maybe fairy tales um, of, of how those planetary systems formed and then explore which of those stories hold up. And inevitably, the process of science is whenever someone comes up with a good story, someone else tries to, to think of a new wrinkle that, that maybe uh, challenges it. So we're still fully engaged in that process of, of trying out new ideas and, and then having to figure out what sort of epicycles do we need to add to, to, to match the data we have. The uh, various systems that you showed today seem to have tremendous amounts of interaction and um, evolution and variety. How does that fit into stability in a very old universe? So there may be a little bit of selection bias. I, I, I picked the things that I thought were most interesting. <laughs> um, so, so it is true there certainly are many planetary systems we've discovered where there are interesting interactions. Nevertheless, the, the time scales for those interactions to, to be, be sort of manifest and significant in a, in a macroscopic way, not as in microscope, 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 macroscope, um, not, but, but rather in terms of sort of small changes that don't change picture qualitatively versus, say, planets colliding with each other or getting flung into the star. You know, those sorts of big events. The times are sort of necessarily long, right? So, so planetary systems start with a whole bunch of small bodies that are colliding with each other, growing up, um, and, and they c continue to collide and agglomerate until they're far enough apart that the time scale for successive collisions is sort of comparable to its age. And so rather than thinking of the solar system as something that's static, if you sort of think of it as something that's uh, growing up over time, well, then in the early solar system, these interactions were occurring very rapidly. And as time went on, the time between strong interactions ha has gotten longer. Uh, we see that both in things like the, the cratering rate on the moon, and also when we study things like, you know, could our solar system be unstable? Could Mercury fall into the sun or something, right? So people actually ask these questions, not as in the next decade, but in, you know, five billion years could, could that happen. So whenever we look at these systems, it's good to keep in mind sort of their ages, right? So if I see something that I think is a billion years old, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to self-destruct in 100 years. Right, because you have to have a remarkable timing. But it's not all unlikely that maybe that system is only stable for another billion years. And so uh, this sort of gets to your question of that, that ring system that sort of appeared to be uh, in a, a special time for it. Um, so we're trying to, to piece together a story. Most of the action happens early on, at very early stages of plant formation. As time goes on, the times between events tends to, to grow longer and longer. And so 
we see mostly old systems where we get excited if we see the interaction, <laughs> right? Because it, it is somewhat rare and it, that it's detectable at least. Um, but in the early stages, they were probably a lot more common, both in our solar system and in others. Are there entropy uh, descriptions of planetary systems, and do they matter? <laughs> um, that, that's a, a, a nice, clever thought. Uh, so at this. If different people approach problems different ways. It's always interesting. So, uh, you know, Scott is a master of the clockwork universe. He he does fancy math, and he, if everything worked perfectly, were smooth and laminar, and everything, like he he, he did remarkably, and he finds beautiful systems. Um, other people approach things from a, a more brute force type of way. So I'm going to, to put things in my computer and, and evolve them forward and see what happens and look at how chaos manifests itself. And, and and your approach of, could I look at this from a statistical mechanics point of view and think about it as, as a thermodynamic system, uh, is sort of taking it even one step further to, to an extreme there. There's perhaps some value in that. People have considered, uh, you know, can we think of a, a planetary system in a thermodynamic sense, particularly in the early stages when you have, uh, say, a ton of little dust grains and they're sort of agglomerating. Uh, the challenge is to make a useful model. So uh, you can you can write down stuff, and and you can do fancy math, and sometimes it's useful, and sometimes it's not. And so the, the challenge is to, to find prescriptions that are both complex enough to match what's going on, but simple enough to gain intuition that you wouldn't get otherwise. And, and I'm trying to think of a case. I, the, the cases I can think of are probably in coagulation codes, where they study the, the, the growth from very small grains, things like dust particles, up to, say, uh, you know, a kilometer in size. There's a humongous dynamic range. And doing that uh, you know, brute force would be just totally intractable. But you can sort of imagine, well, I have a reservoir of small bodies and, and different sizes and, and how they interact. So some people do take that approach. Um, and But even then, oftentimes, it, it, it's so complicated, you'll still need to use numerical methods to, to make those calculations practical. What's the uh, state of the art in determining composition of planetary atmospheres? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, we might. Do we? Do we have a, a t another? No, I guess not. Maybe. Um, so, so one of the the, the 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 main efforts that we're trying to say now is we, we found all these planets. We want to learn about them. Uh, we want to learn what is, what's their bulk composition. Uh, that's sort of inaccessible, right? We can't. We certainly can't take a, a sample home in, into our lab. Um, we can measure bulk properties like its mass, radius, density, and try to use to infer what their bulk properties could be. The one place where we can sort of get, okay, I shouldn't say direct, but, but fairly direct evidence is if we have light that passes through their atmospheres. We can learn what their atmospheres are made out of. And so there's basically two approaches to doing this. One is you have the planet pass in front of a light bulb or a star, and you watch that starlight go through its atmosphere, and you see what's missing and, and what's, what wavelengths of that light are missing which aren't, and you use that to infer the presence of absorbers in the atmosphere. And uh, people have, have tried that uh, with, with several planets. Once you start going to the small planets, the results are... Um, perhaps not as varied as you would hope, uh, in the sense of you might have hoped to see absorption lines from water, from methane. Uh, for, the, for the small planets, we've basically seen things that are consistent with a black body spectrum, no uh, you know, clear absorption lines. And we interpret that as evidence for something like clouds or hazes high up in the atmosphere, meaning that the path of light that we're seeing can't actually go through the deep levels of the atmosphere where you get lots of absorption. It just goes through the upper layers where there isn't really much going on. Um, the other way to study them is through thermal emissions. So the planet's hot, it's radiating at all wavelengths into space, and the atmosphere absorbs some of that infrared radiation, and we can look at what wavelengths get out. Um, and and that, that method has, has also been applied, uh, but predominantly or, or almost exclusively, to, to larger planets. So uh, at the time you get to giant planets, we've seen evidence for things like water. Uh, we measure things like the, the winds redistributing heat from the dark side of planets to the light side. Uh, there's, there's less, uh, well, there's information of the temperature structure, so how the atmosphere's temperature is a function of height is. And then there's less clear claims about uh, some other molecules in their atmospheres. Uh, and, and they're close enough that uh, I would have to, to look at the literature to, to remind myself of which ones I believe and which ones I don't. Uh, so there are, there are some that are credible. There are some that are a little bit dubious. Um, but uh, those results are basically confined to, to Saturn-sized, maybe one Neptune-sized planet. Uh, 
um, and so we don't really know a lot about the atmosphere of the Earth mass planets yet from an observational perspective. And so at the moment, we're trying to, to infer what's plausible and what to predict, looking forward to the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a, a big NASA mission planned for, I think, now 2018 launch, which in, in principle could be able to learn about the atmospheres of at least uh, Neptune-sized planets you know, in terms of size, at least as small as Neptune. And perhaps if we had really good targets, maybe some planets uh, maybe twice the size of Earth. Um, but, but we need to find those good targets. And so a lot of the efforts uh, that, that are planned between now and then are to find small planets around bright stars that are really good targets for that mission to study their atmospheres. So it's a multi-step process still as we work through this. We're, we're getting close to time for the break. Uh, before we break, uh, Greg. Yeah, so uh, we're going to do the break now. We'll come back at 10.45 uh, uh, before we thank Eric and Scott for their work. I just, yeah. Okay. Let's do it now. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make a comment about questions because we have to distribute the microphone to every question Person. I'd like to keep the questions mostly to the question period, okay? I didn't want to step on Eric's, uh, what would you call it, joie de vivre or uh, his mojo or something. Uh, but uh, but uh, if it's a clarification question, sure, ask it during the talk. But if it's going to be a multi-part question with lots of things, let's save it for the extensive question period after the talk, okay? So... Uh, Anyway, uh, so enjoy the break, and we'll be back here at 1045. Thank you.